Hello, everyone. This is Tom Aiken. Welcome to our 11th episode of BoomShare. Uh, this morning, we're going to be talking with Peter Beaumont. Peter was born in England and has traveled to over 80 countries and lived in 13 cities and eight countries so far. He started his career in sales and marketing with Cadbury Schweppes in the UK and has worked for and with some of the most well-known brands like Philip Morris, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, and Creata. In 2012, Peter started his own consultancy company, Connection, and he recently published his first book, The Relationship Roadmap, where he shares his revolutionary method of evaluating, identifying, and measuring relationships to identify the greatest opportunities for effective sales and marketing strategies. Peter, welcome. It's great to see you this morning. Uh, why, don't you, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Hi, Tom. It's uh, nice of you to have me on. Um, so where do I start? It's, um, it's all those countries you just mentioned. I've forgotten how much I traveled. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so just, uh, yeah, probably the two-minute, three-minute brief background. I, as you said, I was born in the UK. I was born in England. Um, aspired to be a professional soccer player and almost made it. <laughs> that was probably the one of the dreams. And then... Uh, uh, I went overseas to the Middle East and lived about 10 years in uh, uh, around the Middle East, mostly in Bahrain, which um, is a small island just off Saudi Arabia. And I worked for Philip Morris there for six years. And then uh, I rejoined Coke, who I'd left, and um, uh, helped introduce Coke into the Middle East, which was incredible. A lot of people don't know this, but Coca-Cola was on the boycott list um, for over 20 years. Um, for various re reasons, mostly political. And uh, uh, I was chosen as one of the team to actually bring Coke back into the Middle East, which was incredibly exciting. I was the only guy on the ground. And to bring a brand like that back was, was just amazing. So I uh, continued my career with Coke, um, ended up moving to Vienna uh, in Austria, and uh, headed up a small team there that looked after McDonald's uh, throughout 29 countries. And then uh, I joined what I call the dark side. I joined an agency, and uh, we, we also had McDonald's as our biggest account. And so I took a lot of that experience with me and knowledge and uh, expertise and um, headed up the German uh, operation, our office there. I was general manager for about five years before moving to the States to the head office in Chicago. And then, as you said, I started my own company about uh, three years ago. So that's kind of the potted travel stroke career summary. <laughs> well that's quite a it's quite a mix of uh, of experience uh, you know pretty impressive in terms of the I'm sure the miles traveled and, and the time spent in, in different areas and with with some major players out there in uh, uh, in the business world so why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your mission and, and what you're working on right now okay yeah I um, it's funny you mentioned that was quite a lot of miles. You're right. In fact, I think um, in the nicest way, I probably knew the hotel receptionists and airline stewardesses more than I knew my own family. But <laughs> it was greeted, you know, hi, Mr. Bowen again. Um, I was on planes quite a bit. Yeah, so I, I think so. travel doesn't worry me too much, and uh, I, I don't do a lot of it now, and I, I'm quite happy not to. The... During the time, I did three basic business disciplines during my career, I suppose, when I look back. They were, I started off with account management. I then gravitated into um, consumer marketing. And then I had some experience in general management where I ran a, a Coca-Cola bottling uh, plant twice, actually, uh, three times in Kuwait, Oman, and Saudi Arabia with 600 people in Saudi Arabia actually reporting to me of all different nationalities. And if you look at those three business disciplines, they're actually very linked, all of them, with actually having to form relationships, both internally and externally. So there was the customer side, which is the obvious one. But if you're a, a marketeer uh, and or a general manager, you have to have really successful relationships internally to make sure your team clicks, going in the right direction, and everything's working according to plan. And then, of course, manage those all-important um, uh, you know, issues that crop up whenever you're talking with people. <laughs> so uh, whether that's from, you know, bonuses and salaries to, you know, I won't 
I don't want to uh, be in the same truck as this guy because he smells. And so, and that's the kind of thing it got down to in, in when you're talking about Coca-Cola bottling and, and trucks in, in the Middle East. So that whole background was suddenly, I suddenly realized that when you were talking about customer relationships, none of us really plan them. They kind of, we expect them to happen because we're good at relationships in, hopefully, in our family and with our friends. But if you think about it, we don't have to plan them because they're almost forced upon us. But when it comes to a business situation, we have to think more about whether the relationships are going to get us to our goals, whether we can make them meaningful, and how do we do that? And it's normally the same kind of core things that we do in our family, which is to bring value, to be thoughtful, to, to help people. And uh, but apart from that, you've got to make sure you're focusing on the right people too. And so that that whole, I suppose it has been going on in my mind for quite a while, brought together something that I called relationship mapping. And so that's where the business, the basis of the business started, which was why I called it connection, play on words, connecting, connecting with people. And then um, my book, which you kindly referred to earlier. The basis of it is actually mapping relationships. That's the core start. Yeah, and you and you created kind of a, a pretty unique process for doing that. Is is that right? Yeah, I haven't seen anybody else use this kind of process. I call it a six-step process. So I'll walk you through it very briefly because I think it's interesting. It is unique. It is revolutionary. I have, most. Um, Account management teams work on CRM systems, which people are familiar with, but they're really just what I call the old Rolodex. You know, it's a store of names and contacts, but it really doesn't do much about evaluating or planning, and I stress the word planning, where you're going to go with those relationships. I'll give you a quick example. Um, when I was with um, one of the companies I worked for uh, more recently, a CEO was appointed to that company, major company. And we had no coverage on that guy. He came out of left field. He came from within the company, but nobody had a relationship with this person. And that's when you deal with just one account, that's almost, I would call, um, irresponsible not to have made sure you had coverage or had a relationship with somebody who might at some point be a candidate or take over a, a main job with the company. And so what I've... Um, Put together the relationship mapping, if you like, is just a it's a sort of evaluation of where you are in terms of and grading your relationships. It's a bit like a an exam, I suppose. How good is my relationship with Tom? Is it you know I use the traffic light system. Is it red? Is it yellow or is it green? And green would be very tough, by the way. That would be, you know, the, the, the customer asks your advice every so often, um, uh, rings you up you know, uh, spontaneously and ask your advice. That's how close the relationship would be in the green zone. So once you've done that, you can kind of get a feel for where your strengths and weaknesses are in with your relationship with all your contacts. It's not just for you, though. It's for other people in your own organization. And so once you've mapped it, then you have to define, because oh, that's fine. So, so we could go, ah, oh, great relationship with Jim. We play golf every week. But guess what? Jim doesn't make the decision. <laughs> as to whether you're going to continue doing business with that company. So um, that's the next stage you have to start. So having looked at the first stage, which is analyzing where you are, then you have to determine what roles these people play and um, whether, you know, whether they're the budget person or they're the user of your product, service, or idea, or whether they're just a gatekeeper. And they're people that tend to just say no rather than actually have any authority to say yes. And then the thing that's often overlooked, the fourth category which I use, is a coach. Uh, there's very often a coach over there sitting in that company that understands what you're trying to do and why it makes sense. And obviously, as they're within their own company, can see some ways that can, they can help you get that satisfied. And that's the old sales thing that used to be called the win-win. So that's the kind of starting point. You start with a map, and then you, and then you go from there to analyzing who is playing what role and why they should be important to you. And then from that, you derive a customer strategy plan. And, and the reason you derive a customer strategy plan is I have looked, I've written a lot of business plans in my career. Uh, it's something that large companies do religiously on a yearly basis. Um, it's the backbone and forms the basis of decisions, or at least it should do, of where resources go and where you should be spending your time and attention. I have not seen one business plan 
that actually includes the people, the customer integrated within those business plans. And so one of the things I've been working with one of my major clients is integrating a customer strategy plan into their business plans. It's only two pages, but it maps out what the issues are from what we've discovered on the relationship map, what the goals should be that derive from those issues, and then the piece that most people miss is what are the key initiatives? How are you going to achieve those goals? And when I say those are missed, it's because it takes it down to a level of granularity that nobody normally bothers to do, which is we need, let's say one of the goals is we're not, I'm going to have dinner with Tom uh, every six weeks and take him to a sports event um, once every three months. That's fine. That's never going to happen if it just remains on a piece of paper. What you now need is the key initiatives are get my admin, if you have one, or if you don't, I will call and schedule those appointments with his admin in the calendar. Next point. I will find out, I know he likes these three sports, which one he prefers, and I will book a game with the Vikings against the Packers on December 4th and make sure he's available and we go to that game. You've got to be, get to that level of specificity. So um, that's that's kind of... That's more. There's one piece missing that I haven't taken you through, which is that needs to be reviewed on a quarterly basis because people change and things change very quickly in our business nowadays, and so we need to make sure that we uh, we do a quarterly review of whether we're still talking to the right people, whether any of those goals have changed as a result of that, and therefore whether the key initiatives change. And typically, that review on one account or on one map probably takes less than half an hour. So that's the process. Well, uh, I've I've read your book and it's it's a great book. It has a lot of great stories in it. And I'll tell you, uh, I really appreciate the process itself. It, it makes a lot of sense. And the reasons for why someone would would engage at that level of granularity is, is you know, as you say, um, become pretty clear because you know the gap between the relationships or how we re how we should be really managing relationships and how we actually do is. Is really can make the difference and if we can close that gap it, it makes the level of engagement on the customers part so much more powerful and so uh, I, I really appreciate your book and I appreciate your uh, your process uh, for sure thanks um, Tom. now Peter maybe take a minute talk about the uh, talk about the values that drive you to you know do what you do and, and how you do it and why <laughs> That's a that's a very very you know I've noticed that in America everybody says it's a good question. <laughs> yeah, that one is so um, it is a good question because it's very timely. Um, I think it's time to kind of be uh, uh, join our own club here because I think you've written a very good book too, and um, it comes at a really good time for me. Uh, so I've, I've almost finished it. I hate to say, I was hoping to finish it by the time we went on air today, but I haven't. I will be very honest. But what I have got to is the core of it, where I went through um, one of the, well, several of the exercises. And, and so this is a long way of answering your question, but I think I need to give it this back cloth first before I do. Uh, because it would be easy to say, well, these, these are my core values. It, <laughs> it, it wasn't that easy. And so... Uh, I've probably known what they are in the back of my mind, but I've never focused on them before. And um, I, I have to say to you that I came to the feeling this morning that what I do and what you do, there's actually a link there, which I want to explore at some later stage, because a lot of what uh, you talk about is related to making relationships. If you know what your core values are, are you tend to recognize them in other people, and they will form the basis of a, a good, solid relationship, no doubt about it. And that's probably something I've missed. I instinctively knew it, but I never really thought about it before. So let me try and answer your question. You, your book's great. I love it, because you've written it um, in a way that's easy to, to follow. I, I, I was a little bit – I found uh, the second chapter, I was struggling slightly, but I thought, you know what? It, I can see the light here. I know where it's going. Then suddenly, the light was there, and like
down to probably 10 or 11 sections now. So let me, so a long way of answering your question. Here's what I got down to. I got down to um, fairness. Uh, that's something I, and, and, and I'll go through the words and then I'll try and say why I think that um, leads me to what I'm doing. Fairness, diligence, uh, conscientiousness, thoughtful, passionate, energetic. Now there's a few others, but I've chosen those because I think they're, main, they're probably the main ones. Um, um, and I think the reason, um, and loving's not in there because I'll, I'll come to that later probably, but the reason I chose those is because if you think about those words, they lend themselves to being customer service orientated. And I'll go through them again. Diligent, making sure you deliver what you promise. Conscientious, being always on time. Uh, fairness, being absolutely delivering, you know, the, the, the letter of the law. Thoughtful, thinking about them. Energetic, being passionate as well. I use the word passionate. I think those two can be linked together, passionate and energetic. You're very, you know, you feel very um, determined about getting something done with them. So I think all of those lend themselves to, um, those are the core ones, for having a good relationship with a customer. So I think your question was a good one because it, 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 if you'd asked me that question six weeks ago, I probably couldn't have answered it as well as I probably think I have. <laughs> well, I, I think you did a great job, and, and I really appreciate you taking a minute or two to talk about the process that's in my book. And, uh, you know, having gotten as far as you have in the book, you've probably recognized that at one point I admitted that in, the, in say, the, the lowest point in my life, the part where I just felt like everything I was doing was failing, all of a sudden I realized I really thought I had been living a values-driven life, but didn't really understand what my own personal values were and how to define them. And so that was what drove me to kind of create that process. And, uh, and there's reasons why I also created the process so that it works with the GPS3 tool that I created. Um, and this video isn't about me, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to the next question. But thanks for sharing those, and and, and I really appreciate you taking the time to explain what they mean to you. Well, um, I think I'll just I'll just let me just talk, just uh, if I may leverage off that, and and um, because I think it's a really interesting subject. Here's what else I learned, which um, you've probably come across before, is that there were some values in there. I think the key question is, what would you like people to think of you? You didn't say it, but what you meant is when you're not around anymore. Um, <laughs> so when you die. So one of the things that, you know, um, and that's kind of very salutary. You know, you, and there's a couple of values that I've not been living uh, that I've brought, I will bring to the front that I would like to have thought people would think of me that wasn't in that list. And that was kind of like, Oops, <laughs> and uh, one of those was love it, you know, because you know, listen, I'm from England. We have the stiff upper lip, you know. We don't, uh, we're not, uh, you know, we're not demonstrative in any way. The kids are to be brought up, seen but not heard. Actually, put in little baskets under the stairs like Harry Potter. I mean, so you know, it's that's <laughs> that's pretty typical. So uh, it's it's just so you know, that process opened up some. Uh, um, areas that I hadn't thought about before. So anyway, just wanted to leverage off the point you made. Well, you know, just to your point, uh, the, the key there was, uh, that was a question that was, I saw in that light too. It's kind of the question that you, the answers would come after, after you're dead. And, and, the right. question, and what drove me to that was the question of why would I want to wait until I'm dead to find out what <laughs> words people would use to describe me? Because at that point, why would I care? And it's too late and it's, and, and, and I can't do anything about it. Right. So all, all we can do is create a way for pe to, to allow people to use those words. And if we don't allow people to use those words, they won't. Right, 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 exactly. So thanks again. I, I appreciate you taking the time to, you know, to talk about it and share your insights and what you learned because uh, I, I think it's so important and uh, I wouldn't have written a book about it if I didn't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> so so how are things going so far peter um things are good I, I was i was very lucky i i came out of um when i formed the company i i i had two clients that you know they talk to you about consultancy and not many people have the luxury of this of making sure you bridge you know just don't jump into consultancy without clients and i had two that were 
keen to go with me before I actually made the jump. So I was very fortunate, and uh, both of those are still with me in different shapes and forms than they were before, but I, I'm still with those two major clients. Um, but I, what are one of the things that uh, I think you learn about as a consultant the hard way is, you know, one of the things that dawned on me recently was I've always had clients that I worked with and I therefore spent a lot of time on trying to sell more of what we've got with them, so products. It's very different selling concepts. Um, so you, I've got two areas of concern. One is how do I communicate what I do in a clear and concise way that people get it? And probably what I did in the first couple of years was assume that people would understand because they had. I had two really good clients, two major you know, companies that everybody knows as household names. So it was, this is fairly okay. Then you suddenly realize I hadn't filtered the second thing that dawned on me is I hadn't filled that sales funnel ahead of time. I was so concentrating on publishing the book and producing an app to go with the book that I hadn't thought about new clients. And so the two, those two issues started to merge, which was I don't have future business right now, number one. And number two is, do you know what? The reason I don't have future business is I haven't focused on how to communicate how I can help people with what I'm doing. So what are the problems they're facing? And that light has only really come on in the last couple of months for me, which is to find out what people who touch customers, what are the problems that face them day to day that what I've got can help them with? I've just uh, probably assumed, coming from a product background, that, you know, I've got a can of Coca-Cola here and it's going to provide you refreshment and I'm just going to sell it as long as you need refreshing. That, that's a hell of an assumption, you know. It's, uh, so what are the problems facing people out there with their relationships with their customers that I can help them with, either blog or provide them resources and tools, training um, and other uh, resources to help them. So it's been a bit of a switch in mindset for me, and it's I'm going through it right now. So to answer your question, things are pretty good, but if I, I you know, I have realised that to to do what I really want to do, which is serve a lot of clients and really help people do a better job at um, handling their clients, I've got to do some different things, or do some things differently. And, and so if if I'm hearing you right, you're saying one of the the most biggest challenges that you have is is defining your value proposition in a in a bite size in a bite size manner that, that potential customers who you don't have relationships with today would be able to say chew and swallow. Yeah, I th that's and that was a problem. I, I I I then spent some time on coming up with a value proposition, call an elevator pitch. It, it, they're all very they're both related very much. How can you say very concisely in a few words what you do? I can do that. I've got that down, but it still doesn't really answer how I how I help. How, what does that do for you? So, so if I said what I do as my value proposition, you could put and, and um, you know, and I can. <laughs> you would probably go okay, fine, but I'm not sure it would really help you go. Yeah, I do have that problem, or I had that problem, and I wish I could solve it. And so that's the key: getting that little nug it in there somehow and so that's what I'm going through right now in fact um, I'm going out onto group discussions on LinkedIn and I'm going to start asking some very pertinent questions which is what are the what are the things that you know keep you awake at night or you have problems with with your customers that I'm and I'm not even suggesting I can help them with I'm just want to find out okay so do you have any stories so far about maybe where you've had some challenges and you had to you know, rely back on those values, understanding you just defined them, but you, you kind of still had an understanding of what they were. How did yep. those values drive how you reacted? Um, yeah, I, I, I had one last year, actually, and I've had probably quite a few if I think back. And you're right. I, um, now I've got more clarification around um, the values it'll probably crop up more often. But I, I think, again, as I said earlier, I instinctively, you, I think you instinctively know what your core values are. It's when you have to sit down and do an exercise that the light bulbs start flashing and going off that you, you're like, oh, yeah, right. That really is something I care about. So, um, but there was, but those light bulbs were going off 
um, last year when I was with one of those, I'm st you know, I said to you have two major accounts. One of them I actually ended up resigning a piece of the business from. I still work with them on another piece. But I found that I was being put in a situation, it's something that they wanted and, and, and value that I could do, but it was something I couldn't deliver on. And um, I, I won't go into any detail, it's not important. I think the, the important point is that it contradicted some values that I felt I had, which was, first of all, being conscientious. I couldn't deliver what they wanted um, in a conscientious way. I just couldn't do it. The uh, I didn't think it was fair. <laughs> I was taking a substantial amount of money per month, but not really delivering what they wanted. And they were just being very kind about it. It'll come, it'll come. I knew it wasn't going to come <laughs> because my heart wasn't in it and I was doing something I wasn't particularly good at. It's funny how that works, isn't it? We, we're good at things we like. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I always I always say people will do amazing things when what you're asking them to do aligns with what they truly value. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's why I think the whole understanding of core values is so important because it, you start off much quicker out of the starting block if you know that, right? Because you're playing to all your strengths and, and where you know you should be, not just your strengths, but knowing where you feel comfortable, right? And I felt very uncomfortable. I was taking money from a company that I liked and respected that had given me a great start to my business, and I wasn't really delivering what they wanted. And that made me feel extremely uncomfortable. So I ended up resigning the business, that piece of the business. I, I rang the guy I worked for who brought me on board. He'd been a cust he'd been a customer before when I was with the agency. I liked him, respected him, become a friend. And I said, you know what? I can't deliver on this. I really can't. As much as I love what you're paying me, it's not fair to you and it's not fair to your company. And the, the amazing response was, you know what? We've been worried about budgets recently. You just helped me out of a hole. Uh, and plus, I really respect you saying that because I felt you were going to get there. What you're saying is probably not. And I'm like, no, not probably not. I won't. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> it's, it's better to be, uh, you know. I think as a result of that, not only did I keep his friendship, and I, 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 that is questionable whether I'd have lost that anyway, but it may have stretched it if he'd been under pressure to, uh, from his company to cut me and he wanted to protect me as a friend. That would have put his internal relationship under a lot of strain so i think that helped him enormously i helped him with budget and i think i got more respect from him for volunteering to say i'm not delivering let's just you know forget it it's not fair to both of us yeah i i would say you you basically strengthened the bond of trust between the two of you which strengthened your your connection and uh and that's something that you know sounds like it happened in ways you didn't even expect but you did it because because you wanted to you wanted to maintain some integrity behind those values of being conscientious and being fair to your customer, which which is, is sometimes counterintuitive to the way a lot of us think. Um, we don't want to give up that that revenue base if uh, you know for anything. And so you you may have actually created more opportunity to do business with this customer and for him to share his experience about his relationship with you with other people. Actually, that's you know that's a really interesting comment. I I hadn't thought of that but whilst you were talking it did remind me of something that i was talking to somebody about the other day which was i've never followed and it spun off of a webinar i've been watching i've never followed the money if that makes sense i've never done anything purely for revenue my whole career has been about doing the things that i wanted to do that i that i was ha and, and by the way i've been very fortunate i've had a wonderful career and the the kind of the travel, which I wanted to do, and the salary and the promotions all followed because I just got on with doing what I wanted to do and was very fortunate enough to be given those opportunities. And so um, I'm hoping that's going to continue because <laughs> when you're on your own as a consultant, uh, you know, sometimes you get, you, you, and I think this is why the value thing is really important, you can start to contradict your values, your core values, by chasing the dollar for the sake of the dollar. And so I was really pleased with what I did with that account because I remained true to my core values. And uh, and I think that will, uh, and that was right. I felt comfortable about doing that. Yeah. 
Well, the camera was on you, but while you were talking and saying how you remain true to your core values, I was pumping my fist in the air for you. So, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I appreciate when people people are able and willing, which is the the more difficult part, to actually put their values in front of things like the financial the financial aspects of a relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't we don't want to manage relationships with people by financial statements. That just doesn't make sense. So. If, if we truly rely on them to be to, for our success, then we have to actually help them understand why our success equals their success. Yeah, I'm in to that, yeah. So so what's next? Anything new that you're working on? Um, yeah, I, I've just, uh, um, given the fact that I've realized a few things recently that I've been doing that probably I shouldn't have been doing. Uh, <laughs> probably a lot, actually. But when you come out of a... Let's call it a, the umbrella of safety of a corporate corporation and several corporations. Uh, I, I thought I'd just you know be able to walk into doing my business. Uh, I've got all the business disciplines. I've, I've done business plans. I've worked you know over the globe. I thought it would be a fairly straightforward. And so I put together a website which I thought was pretty good. And uh, then I've realized over the last six months is probably not very good. And so um, the biggest challenge right now is, is, is to turn around what I said, what I alluded to earlier, which is I want to try and help people solve people's problems instead of talking about me and what I've done. And so um, that is a big shift, and it's a big shift on my website too. So instead of talking about the about page, most people put about them, I want to talk about what I can help people with. And then and then give them at the bottom of that page why I can help them because that's the piece about well I've got the experience and I've done these sort of things. But it starts with how I can help them. Um, the other thing that's going to be very different is I didn't have anything that was interest apart from my blog on the website. So uh, um, why would anybody read my blog and say this guy can help me with an issue if I haven't got things I can offer? So I'm very excited at the moment. I've, I've actually putting together what I call the Connection Academy. And I'm going to offer everything from what I would call the Rolls Royce. It must be part of my heritage. That's the that's the day and a half workshop down to the mini. Comes from my work heritage as well, which is probably the two hour, you know, this is where you should this is some things that I could help you with. And then um, putting some offers in there if you buy into a reduced two hour session. I'll throw in a half an hour consultancy for two weeks for free. So those are the I'm putting those packages together. So I, um, so a full blown physical workshop to a webinar, and then the last piece of that will be to buy uh, or download um, programs straight to your computer and do, learn them at your own speed. So I'm very excited about that because it means I can serve any type of audience demand depending on that the, the size of their pocket um, or the size of the company. So, so what do you need in order to uh, to make that work for you? Um, what, how can people who are watching this video help you? <laughs> um, inundate me with emails. I need you. I need you. I, I think uh, <laughs> um, don't go and check out my website right now until we get it relaunched. Um, but it does give an idea of, uh, of what I do. I, I think uh, anybody out there who's in account management has um, uh, has. Customers that are at least sixty percent have one customer that's at least sixty percent of their business are reliant upon them. They need to get they need to get deeper vertically and horizontally with that customer. I can help you do it. That's the kind of thing that I can I can do. So anybody that's out there that has that faces those kind of problems, then that's the kind of person I can help. How can people get in touch with you, Peter? Okay, that's really easy. So um, it's. Uh, my my website is easy to get to. It's www.connectionconnxn.net, or you can email me at peter .beaumont at connection connxn.net. So those are the two easy ways of getting hold of me. Or okay, well, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Or LinkedIn or tweet. So I'm I'm I've got a Twitter account under Peter at Peter Beaumont Connection, and I'm on LinkedIn, and that's easy to find me, Peter M Beaumont. So yeah. Okay, great. So, Peter, before before we close, is there anything that uh, maybe you wanted to cover I didn't ask about? Anything you wanted to add? Um, I yeah, I think um, the thing that I found whenever I talk talk to people about what I do, uh, they 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 realize that they they 
uh, are doing some of the things that I mentioned earlier, which is they're just taking relationships with their customers for granted, and they're not really planning them and thinking about them. Um, for example, say one of your own people in your company goes under a bus and they've own, they own the relationships with that account. What are you going to do then? So it's not just external relationship building, it's making sure you have the coverage internally as well. And those are the kind of things that people don't often think about that makes the difference between being professional and keeping clients that are important to you and building their business and perhaps losing them. Great point, great point. Well, I want to I want to show off your book one more time before we close, and uh, I I definitely want to say thank you, Peter, for joining me, and uh, and telling your story and sharing some of the insights that you have uh, from your experience and uh, and where you're going. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. Enjoyed it. Okay. Have a great day, Peter. Everyone else, we'll see you at uh, Boom Share number twelve. And uh, until then, have a have a great time.